All right. Good morning, folks, and welcome to the Palliative Care Friday Chalk Talks on this wonderful July morning. Uh, today, we are talking about management of mucositis due to cancer treatment. And to help us do that, we have a superb guest. We have Dr. Vishal Kapadia. <laughs> Vishal uh, completed his HPM fellowship at the University of Kansas and started an embedded palliative care clinic in ENT to help with head and neck cancer symptom management at the University of Texas Southwest Medical Center. And he is one of the authors of the recent fast fact on multimodal analgesic strategies for cancer related oral mucositis. So we are very lucky to have him with us today. Welcome Vishal. Thank you. And I'm very honored to be here today. So our, our format for today is gonna to be two parts. Um, we've agreed to a handful of questions, five or six, depending upon how many we get through in about 20 minutes or so, really focusing on some of the treatment pearls. And then we wanna save a few minutes at the end for some conversation from the audience. So <clears throat> we uh, our first topic is really all about the importance of anticipatory guidance in treatment. Can you t take us through a little bit about how you help your patients prepare for what's going to come? Yeah, so thank you again for having me. And a lot of the work that I have been doing is with a lot of the head and neck cancer patients. Um, and a lot of this is going to be very applicable to all patients getting chemotherapy radiation, especially in the oral areas. I think a lot of it is going to be specific to head and neck cancer. So I think in order to talk about anticipation, we need to take a step back and talk about mucositis. Like, you know, why does it happen? Why is it very common with people getting chemotherapy and radiation treatments? Well, you know, not going too much into the path of is when we talk about cell death, chemotherapy, radiation, you know, in our oral cavities, we have rapid rates of mitosis, and that's why it's very prone to injury. When you have chemotherapy, radiation, direct damage to the area, you know, increased inflammatory markers leads to cell death and can cause a lot of our oscillations and um, again, cause mucositis. And really the key part of that is that when there's direct damage, the damage is gonna be there until that nidus of what's causing that damage is no longer there, All right? So when we talk about chemotherapy, you know, in general, I mean, the studies that show both solid tumors, about 20 to 40% of patients get mucositis. And that usually starts after maybe a few days to maybe like two weeks, of after starting treatment. Um, usually the ones that have like fluorouracil, methotrexate, etoposides, these are the ones that are bigger culprits in starting mucositis for chemotherapy. Now with radiation, it's more focal to the area. And that's why some studies show up to 90% or even more of these patients get mucositis. So these symptoms usually start around the second and third week after treatment. And in my experience, they could be a lot more intense than chemotherapy mucositis. Uh, so I share this with you because as healthcare providers, we need to make sure that we educate our patients. You know, I wish that I saw most of my patients before they started treatments. I think most of my patients I saw was after a few weeks of already ongoing treatments. If I could have seen them earlier, I was going to say, hey, mucositis is not a if, it's more of a when, right? And if it doesn't happen, that's great. That's what we're hoping for. I just really worry it's going to happen. So if it's going to happen, what are some things we could do to try to prevent or minimize the symptoms, as well as what can we get, do to guide these patients in, you know, when these symptoms happen, this is what you, exactly what you should do. So when we look back about, you know, how do we prevent it, we got to talk about the risk factors associated with this. A lot of it's things like smoking, chewing tobacco, poor oil, um, dental hygiene, and so forth. So if we had that time before starting chemo or radiation, you know, try to get them to see the dentist. You know, if they need to get any teeth extracted, please go ahead and do that earlier. You know, make sure that we are, you know, cleaning our mouth, good oral hygiene. Some studies have shown that glutamine has been very helpful, but, you know, when we talk about stem cell transplantations, you know, glutamine is kind of contrary, it's not kind of indicated, but it's recommended against using. And then the last part on that is that, you know, when we talk about all these predisposing factors for, mucositis, a lot of them are predisposition factors for people having head and neck cancers too, right? So that's why you see it so common in this population. Mm. So if we could try to prevent it, right, by good oral hygiene, making sure that we cross all our T's, down our I's, we get our oral cavity, that's great. Now, 
how do I prepare our patients? That's the big thing is to say that, hey, these symptoms are going to happen. So we are going to talk about some medications that we can start. And this is how you should use them when you start experiencing these symptoms. And a lot of times, I think maybe your patients do. I know my patients don't. Mm. They hate medications. You know, they're already on 30, 20, 15 medications and they don't want to add more. When we talk about pain management, it's a multimodal approach. It's not just going to be, hey, take this oxycodone and call me in the morning. Like that's that's never the case. It's multimodal talking about adjuvant treatments, you know, non-adjuvants, other modalities. So they have maybe be on four or five different medications to treat their mucositis. And so that's encouraging them saying, we're going to be doing this ahead of time to make sure we control the pain and control the symptoms. My goal and my hope is to get rid of all these medications after all your treatments are over and we'll make sure we'll guide you step by step. So that's usually what I typically do if I get the lucky opportunity to see patients before they start treatment. Unfortunately, most of my patients I see are after that two, three week period where their pain is very severe and the mucositis is very bad. Though I will say, even when we get patients here in the hospital, um, still that anticipatory guidance is so valuable. The relief I see in people's faces when we talk about the time course, they're just unaware that this is something that is temporary. This is short-lived. We will get you through this. And yeah, the fear of, I don't want to be on opiates forever. You will not be. We're going to get, this is temporary. We will get you through. And um, it makes a big difference. I completely agree. Exactly. And you lead to a great point that when we talk about palliative care, it's not just the physical part, but multi-domains too, right? right? That, hey, the alignment and the support, hey, I'm going to be with you every step of the way, right? This is going to be a scary process, but I'm here with you. Those are all makes profound impact into the patient's care. Indeed. And a perfect segue to our bread and butter pharmacology. So based on your experience, what really is that? foundation? What should we be starting with for treating mucositis pain? So great question. I think from our perspective, we need to take a step back and say, what's causing this pain? Like what type of pain are we dealing with? Right. And that way we're kind of able to hone in, in terms of specific pain management. So when we talk about the oral cavity um, and mucositis, you know, there's going to be the nociceptive part of pain, but because of the so many nerve endings and nerves that travel to the oral cavity, there's going to be a lot of neuropathic pain. So if you forget about the neuropathic pain, these patients are going to still have a lot of pain and a lot of symptoms despite, you know, trying to treat the nociceptive pain. So, you know, can we target therapies that have both nociceptive and for neuropathic pain? So my bread and butter pharmacology is first, let's maximize the adjuvant treatment. So when we talk about Tylenol, you know, ibuprofen, some of these patients that are more upstream in the hospital, again, you might want to avoid that because, you know, there might be in the other issues, they might have some renal issues, some bleeding and so forth. In the outpatient setting, I found ibuprofen to be extremely helpful in treating some of these patients. Mm -hmm. You know, can we talk about things like, you know, gabapentin, right? So again, that could help more from the neuropathic pain perspective as well. But really, you know, when we talk about, those are kind of more at the, the advanced side, what you see, and I think there is a TikToker by a guy named Dr. Glockomofekin, where yeah. he illustrates nephrology as someone holding salt, right? <laughs> so my analogy is radiation oncology holding baking soda and salt and water together, because that's why you see all the time, hey, let's do salt, baking soda, water rinses. And that has been very helpful because it kind of cleans out the mouth, removes all the dead cells, has some bacterial um, static properties too. Um, so that is one thing. Magic mouthwash using some type of formulation of a Benadryl, lidocaine, Malax, or, um, you know, those are other treatments that could be very helpful in managing the mucositis pain. Um, <clears throat> and then, um, you know, trying to make sure they continue the hydration because there's a lot of inflammation. One anecdotal thing that I found is that, you know, in this audience and people who are listening, if you ever had any wisdom teeth taken out, you know, the recommendation afterwards is, yeah, just, you know, make sure you rinse your water out, but don't spit, right? Because when you spit, it could dislodge some things in the, <clears throat> where your wisdom teeth are at. It could cause infection, cause other issues too. For these head and neck patients with mucositis, the actual act of spitting causes a lot of pain too. 
right? So you're saying, hey, go ahead and do this magic matla, it's just fish and spit. So they feel okay. They may be able to hold the liquid in for maybe 20, 30 seconds. And then you spit it out and that pain comes back. It's like, oh man, I, all the work that we did to try to help that and kind of numb that pain, now you still experience it when spitting out. So usually I recommend is that instead of spitting, swish, keeping your mouth for a little bit and then open your mouth and let it drain out so that you kind of take away that actual part of spitting, which could be very helpful. But usually if... After the you know the mouthwashes, after you know ibuprofen and, um, and Tylenol, after gabapentin, you know after all that is used and the things are not improved or the pain is very severe, like they're in twelve out of ten pain and in the hospital, usually opioids would be my uh, my my next step in terms of treating the pain. So that is kind of my stepwise approach of how I manage it. Yeah, I I know that. Um, you and I have talked a little bit about a Butrans patch. Um, however, I think I'm going to save that question for the end because we've got a, a palliative care pharmacist who's listening today and we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that. We'll circle back to that. Um, um, first time I've ever heard the spit and drain or spit and drool or whatever, however you describe it. That sounds fascinating. Um, it's not the most aesthetic thing, you know, when you no, tell people, it sounds horrible. Pain, but really when patients are in that much pain, they're like, you know, even if you want to give me a suppository, that's going to help my pain, go ahead and do it. You know? So I think that tends to be a bad alternative. <laughs> um, and I, I want to add even, even patients that maybe don't have that classic description of neuropathic pain, assuming that there, there has to be some component of it when there is all of that injury, all of the nerves that are involved. And almost always I find that something like gabapentin or some other neuropathic agent ends up being important and helpful even when they don't describe the classic symptoms of neuropathic pain because there tends to be a component there. Yeah. Um, regarding the route of opiates, I, I swear that I have patients that feel that the liquid formulation helps more than the tablets, this, I don't know, illusion of coding in some way, even though the evidence maybe doesn't support some of that. Do you have strong opinions on liquids versus tablets? <laughs> yeah, so I think it's, you know, to answer these questions, I think we have to add a little bit more about some things that are had in that cancer patient population may go through. A lot of them may have also things like dysphagia or dynophagia, where, you know, things like a G tube may be more essential, right? So, efficacy is one thing, but ease of administration is another too, mm. right? So when we talk about, you know, let's say you have a, a, you just do oxycodone or Nurco, for them to take it and you schedule it every three to four hours PRN, right? So they would have to take the pill, crush it, mix it with water, put it up into the syringe, put it into the G tube, and then flush it again, right? If you're if they're in very a lot of pain and they're doing it every four hours, that's six seven times a day. That's a lot of work and effort for them to do. Yeah. So usually for that, I tend to go from liquid. Now there's a lot of fast facts that shows um, the efficacy of topical morphine uh, or topical opiate, excuse me. And the studies showed topical morphine that we used. It has been very helpful in terms of kind of treating that local pain that patients experience during the mucositis. So. I do feel that a lot of people who are able to swallow, you know, they say, yeah, the liquid works well. Hmm. Anecdotally, in my practice, you know, some people complain about the taste because some of the times with the way they formulate it, it's not, doesn't taste that well. But also, you know, people who could take the pills, sometimes they feel like the pills are stronger. So even though for my practice, if we were to do like a dose by dose conversion, people take less liquid opioids than they did um, the tablet forms. So for my practice, I see that the liquid formulation seems to be better, but um, I think the patients just swear by the oral, like the tablet, excuse me. And I say that because, you know, even though they swallow it, the liquid, and some of it may be affecting locally, they still have their own cancer or cancer related pain and other symptoms they may be experiencing as well. Mm -hmm. So that's why if I had to hypothetically state, mm -hmm. I think that's the reason why they prefer um, tablets more than liquid. At least that's what's been in my practice. Sure. When, um, when your bread and butter farm is not enough for those more complicated cases, what, uh, what do you tend to reach for? What's deeper in your toolbox? So this is when I start thinking about long acting opioids. So typically, you know, when we talk about, so specifically head and neck cancer, getting cured of intent, they're 
chemo radiation treatments last for about seven to eight weeks, right? Each week, things are going to change, right? So their pain, their symptoms are going to constantly fluctuate week by week. Hmm. So when we're talking about long acting opioids, right? You know, we want to make sure that, hey, you know, things are kind of, we could keep things stable and then titrate it with short acting opioids. Which that's what we're trying to do. But with this population, you know, they might start feeling more symptom relief um, by week six. Some may be feel like week eight or week 10 or, you know, afterwards. So it's very variable. So I tend not to start someone right off the bat on a long acting opioid, even though most other, you know, most other disease states for cancer related pain, I may start long acting opioids sooner than later. So, but this is the time that I start thinking about using things like a fentanyl patch, uh, B transplants, or methadone. On paper, methadone is a great drug for this um, for this type of pain because it tackles the nociceptive and neuropathic properties. So, and the methadone is very cheap. It comes in a liquid formulation. You know, there's not that many inexpensive liquid or formulations of long acting opioids that's out there. Fentanyl patch is good because again, you know, you just have to put it once every three days less medications from their intake, they're able to control the pain. B-trans patch, um, I have prescribed it a few times. The issue is in terms of cost, coverage, and availability. Um, you know, another thing that I worry about is that, you know, I could prescribe these medications. I have no problems with that. Decided If I decided to take a week or two off and on vacation, and then the patient needs a refill, most other people may not feel that comfort level. Mm prescribing these medications, right? So if I start talking about methadone or butrans, you know, my radiation oncology or oncology colleagues may not feel as comfortable as compared to a fentanyl patch. So I do have to take that into consideration as well. So for those that are very difficult to treat, then I usually start them on a long acting um, opioid. Um, I tend not to use the, you know, oral formulation of buprenorphine more because um, recent shows, studies show that, and there's an FDA a warning about resulting in using these formulations of buprenorphine can cause dental caries and could cause worsening issues in, in the oral cavity, which right now, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the immediate, maybe it's okay. But then these are some of the patients, especially with radiation, they are, you know, high risk of things like osteonecrosis of the jaw or other things that could impact them long-term from a survivorship that could make a sub, like a profound negative impact on the quality of life. And again, that's the reason why I don't usually use those transmucosure or formulations of buprenorphine. Yeah. So, so again, that's one thing. And then the second thing I would recommend is that those that are difficult to treat is sometimes there's too many cooks in the kitchen, right? So when you have someone getting these treatments, you have the oncologist, you have the radiation oncologist, and then hopefully you have the palliative care doctor too. So when you have Three different doctors, the patient goes to them in intermittent times. They say, hey, my pain is not controlled. You know, they'll usually treat, start something and then something, somebody else will start something and then the management would change. So it's going back to the bread and butter that communication is very key. So making sure we have a good relation with the treatment team, making sure we're in constant communication with each other. So that way, if the treatment is not working and you say, hey, you know, I, I figured that it might not work. Let's try X, Y, and Z. So that way there's more uniform approach to treating these patients. Once that happens, I think most of these issues get better treated because there's not to say, oh, I, I don't think you should be on oxycodone. I'm going to put you on Norco. Oh, I don't think you should be on methadone. I'm going to set you to fentanyl patch, right? Like that happens way too often. And I think if we're able to have more of a direct line of communication and work together as a unit, um, it helps have been very helpful for our patients. Perfect. Um... For those meds that maybe don't have the strongest evidence, are there certain ones that you tend to avoid? And uh, why is that? So before I talk about the one that we may start arguing with, Mark, <laughs> yeah. no, that's perfect. Um, perfect. I, I'm, I'm going to talk about something called like the low light, a uh, low laser light therapy. All right. So that's, it's, mm. like, it's called like photo biomodulation therapy. Mm. You know, it depends on who you talk to. So if you talk to these reps, they're going to talk that that's just like, the best thing since sliced bread for treating mucositis. Mm -hmm. When you look at the literature, there's very mixed reviews on that therapy for mucositis. So again, another thing is cost and how are they going to be able to supply it and is insurance going to cover it? Some aspects of mucositis they, and for certain treatments, like some type of stem cell transplant patients, they may be able to cover, some may not. So usually I am 
kind of hesitant on recommending um, that treatment. Mm -hmm. The other one is like topical dexamethasone. Really, there's not that much that shows that there is that much efficacy compared to standard practices in reducing the duration or the uh, or of of mucositis. And then finally, doxepin. There's one study, uh, I think the Alliance trial, that showed that it has a lot of benefit, and that's the doxepin mouthwash, spit and spit, swish and spit. <clears throat> but then there's other trials that said that even when they compare it to like the BLM magic mouthwash um, concoction, that it ends up being the same. Yeah. My take on that is that, you know, if we have the formulation, if the cost is appropriate and we're able to give it to their patients and we're kind of pulling at straws and saying we can't really do much to help, go ahead and use it and try it, right? Because it's it could be very helpful. I think working in a county hospital, um, seeing these patients and not having even a formulary a lot of times you have to like, you know, compound them, create them, put them. And then if you're not able to continue that as an outpatient or kind of scale it to say, hey, okay, this is not working. How do we improve or um, increase the dose, decrease the dose, and then how much that's going to cost? I, I Again, I really, if not, I, I know doxepin is used for mucositis treatments. I unfortunately have not used that. Yeah. But Marty, I would love to hear about your experiences because <laughs> yeah. I think you had a lot more positive experiences than I have. It's... um similar themes in that we really struggle to prescribe it outpatient because of cost. So I don't think I have ever succeeded in getting anybody to use it on the outpatient side. And, and that's really changed my approach with it. Um, usually I'm meeting patients that are hospitalized. Again, that 12 out of 10 pain, these are patients that are immediately getting started on, on opioids. And they're just here in the hospital almost solely because of her, their mucositis. Um, and so I will consider using doxepin um, with the understanding that I'm not going to probably continue to use it, but I might use it as an adjunct to try to help get patients through the worst of the worst days, you know, when things are at the peak for those three or four days. And whenever I'm using it, a lot of the, the same rules apply for everything else. It's anticipatory guidance. This is something that might burn initially when you're putting it in your mouth. Um, but if you know that ahead of time, instead of being surprised by that, um, it makes it much more tolerable, um, though I will have to try this new uh, swish and drain rather than swish and spit part of it. Um, but I've had I've had some success when just using it inpatient. Um, and I think that's the only way I've been able to approach it again, because cost is just so profoundly prohibitive. No, I appreciate you saying that. And I think that's something that I think we should all ought to try to do because I know there's more research that's needed, um, more evidence is needed, but it doesn't mean that we can say, oh, you know, since we don't have strong proof, we shouldn't use it. Like, mm. you know, these patients, this type of pain is a very intense pain that these patients experience. So I agree with you, Marty, that if there's anything we could do to help, we, we should definitely do that for sure. One, one more point before we move to our last question. Um, I think when I'm reaching deeper and deeper into the toolbox, keeping our general internal medicine differential diagnosis broad, because there are some things that might be confounding our treatment and that we're missing is this reactivation of a, you know, virus that's causing pain. Is this um, oral candidiasis that I'm not treating adequately? There may be other things going on at the same time. Um, not just sort of keeping those blinders on and thinking only about the mucositis piece. No, absolutely. Like you don't want to, you know, treat a oral candidiasis with just magic mouthwash and then call it a day. You know, especially these patients <laughs> who could be very immunocompromised because of the treatments that they're getting. So, absolutely, I think that's a huge, huge point that we need to make sure that we just don't look at it very narrow focus and just this is the pain mucositis treated. It's like, hey, what's causing it? What can we do to prevent it? What can we do to treat it? Is there anything else that's going into the factors? If there's more dinophagia or dysphagia associated with it, you know, do we have, you know, can we, you know, start empirically, you know, for um, oral, can oral candidiasis or, you know, luckily for me, I was in a ENT clinic mm. and they could scope every minute if they wanted to, you know, so it's just like, you know, usually I'm there. I'm like, hey, can you help me on this? Can you, you know, I'm really worried about that they're having some pain, not just um, very proximal, but not too deep, you know, can you just want to make sure there's no candidiasis and they're able to see it. So oh. I can, I guess I'm, I'm spoiled that way. 
<laughs> yeah, my, my colleague who sits next to me always says, "Good, good palliative care starts with good medicine." So keeping that differential broad, yeah, ab- yeah, exactly. So absolutely, um, Peter, I'm going to call on you to ask your question in just a moment, but I'm just going to ask our last one before we go. So you're you're in the queue. Um, so our la- last question, just any any final advice, final expertise that you want to share out outside of your paper. Yeah, and I think it's going back to the non-pharmacological treatments of mucositis, right? Again, we did a lot of work in head and neck cancer, but this is for a lot of patients, not just those patients. But please remember that when having cancer, you know, it could be a life-changing, life-altering event for these patients that is not just the physical pain that they experience. It's really multi-domains, right? Spiritual, emotional, psychological you know, that needs to be taken into account for any of these patients, you know, especially in the head and neck cancer population, I can, I'll bet money on this and I'm not a betting person that anxiety and depression is underdiagnosed mm. in these patients, mm. right? And how that impacts everything else, you know, how it leads to predispositions, coping strategies, mechanisms, you know, if someone, I really had someone who used to drink a lot of alcohol and because the pain got so bad, they decided to say, hey, okay, well, I'm just going to take some Everclear. I'm just going to put it in my mouth and then try to have all the alcohol kind of burn that and just mm-hmm. so that way the pain is so severe. And afterwards, they're like, okay, you know, I'm sorry that you had to go to that extreme to try to treat your pain. Let's see what we could do to help you better control that pain. So again, please don't forget uh, the other domains of palliative care in, uh, in treating these patients. Or maybe reaching for duloxetine instead of gabapentin. Yeah. Yeah. So if it, if it was if this talk was more for head and neck cancer, I use mm-hmm. duloxetine a lot mm-hmm. um, because of the dual properties of you know treatments of you know psychosocial and the neuropathic pain properties. So I do like using duloxetine a lot um, in this population. Gotcha. All right, Peter, you're up. <laughs> Thanks, Marty. <laughs> Um, as he introduced earlier, I'm a palliative care pharmacist for um, Aurora Healthcare, um, work with Marty. And my question is about buprenorphine patches. I know you mentioned that a lot of issues as far as coverage and everything there. When you have used them, do you find the five microgram useful? I, I just... Um, I question whether that is strong enough to take the edge off in these patients. And um, would you say then to just avoid it in those with the the worst cases perhaps and use it just in the appropriate ones or wanted your opinion there? Yeah, Peter. So I'll be completely honest with you. I never prescribed the five. Like usually it's at, at least a 10 that I usually start out with because it's, um, you're right. Like we're talking about when we talk about all mean conversion and still there's not like that, like McPherson guide, um, you know, what's the OME equivalence from so, uh, buprenorphine to um, or morphine equivalent. So, you know, with that, usually when we're getting between like just under 60 OMEs, you know, rarely our patients who are having these severe symptoms are going to have less than 40 to 60 OMEs that they're going to have in a day. So, Usually I never start off with a five. I'll probably start off with at least a 10. I think in hindsight, again, why I tend to avoid long acting, if I'm more of a favor of butrans patch now, but why I don't favor it in long acting opiates as much because for those seeking curative intent, we noticed at least anecdotally that it's so much harder to get off of long acting opioids than it is for short acting opioids. And at least that's my experience. That might not be true, but that's been a very big experience that I've experienced as well. I said experience like five times there. Uh, <laughs> because of that, you know, I, I try to avoid it. So long story short, Peter, I think I, I, I never have used a five. I, I, I'm being completely honest with you because usually the pain is more severe than just the five. Perfect. Thank you. All right. We are right on time. We have one minute to spare. I really appreciate your time today, Vishal, and the experiences you've had, the fast fact you helped write, and this all helps us take better care of our patients. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Um, I appreciate this conversation, and I hope that you know we all could do a little bit better today and tomorrow in taking care of our patients. So I know I learned a few things. I hope that you did too. So thank you all very much. Absolutely. 
All right. Take care, everybody. All right. Bye. Thank you, sir. <laughs> bye.